Well, good afternoon or morning if you are joining us from the West Coast and welcome to the sixth event in our Outcome Estimation Tools training webinar series. Today we're featuring the EPA's Pollution Load Estimation Tool or PLET. So thank you for joining us. I'm Aisha Tapp Ross, Water and Soil Health Scientist for American Farmland Trust, and I'm joined by my colleague Kinsey Reese, Ag Conservation Innovations Program and Communications Manager. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Michelle Perez, the Water Initiative Director, cannot be with us today, but she will re be returning for our November webinar. For those of you who don't know, American Farmland Trust is a national nonprofit founded in 1980. Our mission is to save the land that sustains us by first, protecting farmland, second, promoting sound farming practices, and third, keeping farmers on the land and preparing the next generation of farmers. For today's webinar, after a few reminders and a quick poll to see who's in the room, we will hear from Adrian Donahue about EPA's pollution load estimation tool uh, or PLET. Adrian will first lead us in a presentation and then a demonstration of PLET. Uh, and we have reserved the last 15 minutes of the webinar for Q&A. And we also want to thank our founders, our funders, sorry, our funders, the EPA Office of Water and uh, the Walton Family Foundation and the Mosaic Foundation for making this webinar series possible. Now for some quick housekeeping reminders. We are using the Zoom webinar platform for this series. So that means as attendees, you will have your camera and microphones turned off throughout the event. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen at any time to ask questions, which will be answered during the last 15 minutes of the event. You can use your name or be anonymous when asking questions or making comments. And you can also vote up questions you want prioritized. If you're having any te technical difficulties, you can direct message me or Kinsey and we will try to help you out. And following each webinar, you will receive an email within three to four days that will provide the recording and the slides for the presentations, as well as information about the next month's speaker. And by the following Monday, we will post the recordings to the webinar registration page, which we absolutely welcome you to share with colleagues and friends that may be interested in viewing. In a moment, I will be sharing a link to a, uh, Kinsey will be sharing a link to a six question anonymous evaluation survey that should take about two minutes to complete. The survey will pop up when you leave, but you can also check on it now so it opens in a new tab on your browser. We ask that you please complete the survey right after the event ends. Our presenters and the AFT team rely on these surveys to help inform our next month's speaker and any changes we might need to, uh, uh, to make to the webinar series. Given the low survey participation rate starting this month, everyone who fills out a survey today before 6 p.m. Eastern will be entered to win a $25 gift card. The winner will be notified by email tomorrow morning. We appreciate your participation and wish you luck on the drawing. And now Kinsey is going to uh, ask some poll questions. Great, Aisha, you should see them on your screen. Uh, question number one, which one sector best reflects your occupation? government agency, non-government organization, academic, corporate corporation, or environmental markets developer, or other. Uh, number two, if you are, if there are only four types of audience members, which one best describes you? Developer of outcome estimation tools, methods, or models, current user, a potential future user, or a person interested in learning about them. Uh, number three, what is your experience level with the EPA pollution load estimation tool or PLET? Had not heard of, heard of, but never used, heard of, and used it. I refer to it often. So, give a couple minutes, probably. Oh, wow, everybody's fast this time. <laughs> Uh, 
like one minute here and then I'll end it and then everybody can see the results. So it looks like, can you guys, can you see the um, results, Aisha? Yes, okay. Um, so it looks like government agency, no surprise there, uh, was the one sector that best reflects your occupation. Um, a lot of current users of outcomes estimation tools. Um, and number three, heard of, but never used. That's the majority um, for experience level with play. I'll stop sharing and give it back to Aisha. All right. Thank you, Kenzie. Uh, oh, oh, geez. Um, so on the registration site uh, that we are sharing, oh, that, that Kenzie is sharing in the chat also, uh, you'll see this webinar schedule and links to the recordings, including the most recent September 6th field to market field print platform presentation. Next month on November 1st, we'll be hosting Dr. Drew Kessler, uh, who will be training on the prioritize target and measure application PTM app web tool, a water quality estimator. And we hope you join us for that event. And now without further ado, I will uh, let Adrian take it away. Great, thank you. Give me one second here, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, can everyone see my title slide? Yes, it looks good. Yes, okay, all right, great. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And like I should mentioned, I'm gonna be presenting today on EPA's pollutant load estimation tool. And we have a lot to cover today, um, but just to give a little bit of background information on myself, my name's Adrian Donahue. I'm a physical scientist in the non-point source management branch. Um, within EPA's Office of Water, and the Nonpoint Source Management Branch is home to the Section 319 program, where EPA um, gives grants to states, territories, and tribes to manage polluted runoff programs um, and also implement local projects to restore water quality. My role within the branch, I'm a part of the PLET team. Um, I also provide technical support for urban and hydro modification nonpoint source um, measures. I have a little plug here for our bioretention design handbook that's coming out soon. And then another um, piece of work that I'm heavily involved with is quantifying environmental co-benefits and looking for ways to integrate that into um, reporting for the Section 319 program. And then my training um, is in environmental engineering and I've worked in various um, sectors of water quality. All right, so the agenda today, I've broken this webinar up into four different components. Um, and the demo is actually integrated within the presentation. So first, we're gonna go over the tool background. And here, I'm just gonna describe the underlying structure of PLET, um, as well as highlight the input data sources and then note strengths and limitations of the tool. And then in the second part, for the model interface and modules, we're just gonna walk through what the interface looks like um, and how to navigate it before uh, part three, where we're going to do a, a quick demo. And the quick demo here, it's in quotes because in the PLET user guide, um, right up front, there's a quick 10 step guide to get users up and running with a model. So we're going to apply a scenario using the quick guide um, to develop a model. And then I'm also going to introduce the BMP calculator here. And that'll make more sense in a bit. And then to wrap up, we're gonna just kind of zoom out and look at more bigger picture items. I'm gonna showcase a few examples of other projects that have used PLET, um, show where you can go to learn more about the tool, and then also highlight some future updates um, that are in the pipeline. All right, so tool background. Um, the Pluton Load Estimation Tool, or PLET, it's a web-based tool that estimates annual long-term nutrient and sediment loads from cropland, pasture land, forest, urban uh, land use types. There's also, um, you can also customize the model to do a user-defined land use. And it's also estimating load reductions resulting from BMP implementation. 
who uses PUT. PUT's used by Section 319 subgrantees, watershed planners, academics, conservation districts, and others like you in the audience today. And then why are, um, why are users using PUT? Uh, within the Section 319 program, it's to report annual load reductions, and then it's also used for planning purpose, so planning purposes, excuse me, such as watershed-based plans. And I'm also going to highlight some other examples as well. I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about the differences between StepL and PLUT. So StepL was or is the um, spreadsheet tool for estimating pollutant loads, and that was developed over 20 years ago. Um, prior to PLUT. So as the, the name indicates, it's an Excel-based tool, um, but because we've converted over to this web-based platform um, in PLUT, we're gonna be phasing out support for this over time. But the underlying structure and formulas um, are the same. So PLUT is a web-based tool that was released in March of 2022. And um, along with the web-based format comes along other um, capabilities, such as being able to share your model with other users. Um, it's also more accessible, effective, efficient, excuse me, interactive. And then it also integrates into the um, our grants reporting and tracking system for Section 319 integration. So users can upload their, their annual loads um, estimated by PLET directly into grants. Now looking at a snapshot of some of the different features of PLET, first listed here is scale. So PLET can work uh, or estimate loads starting at the field scale all the way to the HUC-12 um, watershed scale, scale. And in addition to that, you can model multiple fields or HUC-12 simultaneously. The outcomes that we're looking at with this tool are long-term annual loads for both, both pre and post BMP implementation. And this is for nitrogen, phosphorus, biological oxygen demand, which are reported in pounds per year, and then sediment, which is reported in tons per year. We also have volume reduction estimating capabilities, but that's specific to our urban BMP calculator, and it applies to just a few urban BMPs. Um, in terms of conservation practices, PLET includes more than 30 BMPs for cropland and pasture land, and I've listed some of them here, such as conservation tillage, cover crops, critical area plantings, um, but the list, the list continues. For land uses, PLET um, can estimate loads for cropland, pasture land, urban, forest, feedlots, and like I also previously mentioned, you can create a user-defined land use. Urban has an asterisk there because within urban there's um, nine different sub-urban land use categories. In terms of coverage, PLET covers um, all the U.S. states and territories, including America, Samoa, Guam, and Puerto Rico. And then in, term of, in terms of time and data demands, PLUT's a simple tool, and most of the inputs are auto-populated, but that's at the HUC-12 scale. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, about what you would do if you're working at the field scale. All right, so looking at some of the strengths and limitations of the tool. In terms of strengths, PLET's appropriate for planning and screening level analysis. So on the flip side of that, you wouldn't be using PLET to um, do a design of BMPs. Another strength, like I also mentioned before, is you can share models with other users. It includes US territories, and it's also um, highly customizable. So you can create a user-defined land use, you can create a custom BMP, um, and you can also um, create combined BMP efficiencies when you're applying um, more than one BMP to a, a specific land use type. And you can also include other pollutants if you have uh, the necessary data inputs to do that. For limitations, um, PLET does not include point sources. It's a stand um, alone web-based application and it does not reflect subsurface flow of tile drains. And like I, like I mentioned, you wouldn't be using this tool to design a BMP. Another thing that I wanna note is that um, PLET brings in precipitation data from one weather station. Um, and this is determined up front when you're setting up your model. But um, as your area of study increases, so say you're operating at you know, two or more HUC-12 watersheds, um, it's just important to recognize that um, you know, your weather station data isn't as specific as your, as your area of study increases. All right, now we're gonna take a look at the model structure. And this is 
a figure that comes right out of our, out of our user guide. And I like it because it just breaks plot up into four um, distinct chunks. So we're going to look at these um, in depth one by one. So for the user inputs and data server, this includes a series of tables that are listed up front um, when you're setting up your model under the inputs tab. And it includes land use data. And this is auto populated at the HUC12 scale um, using the national land cover data database. Animal counts are also auto, auto populated and this is coming from the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Precipitation, that's based on weather data um, over long term, 30 years, that comes from US EPA's basins system, and then cropland irrigation that's user defined, soil and usable parameters, those are um, coming from the National Resource Inventory from USDA, NRCS, and then septic systems and direct discharges um, stem from the uh, National Small Flows Clearinghouse, but we, we recommend inputting local data if that's available. So what this looks like in PLET, um, you can see that I'm showing uh, the interface here and we're focused here on the inputs tab. So just wanted to start to get you guys oriented on what these input tables look like. I'm showing the first two here just based on space, but you'll notice that okay, these are here. Um, the inputs in red are indicating that this is required information. So when you're setting up your model, um, any value in red, you need to have a number in there. It can be zero, but those, those need to have a number associated with them. All right, we talked about user input and data server information. So now we're going to take a look at the background processes that are happening uh, in the background after all this input information um, is added. So the processes that are occurring are first uh, estimating a runoff volume, and this is done using the NRCS curve number method. Um, this is also the same method that's used in SWAT. For groundwater, groundwater infiltration is equal to a fraction of precipitation that's based on your hydrologic soil group. And then sheet and rill erosion, that's estimated using the universal soil loss equation. And gully and stream bank erosion, um, that is inputted using the stream and gullies um, calcul calculator where it's summing up impaired gully or stream bank loadings. And that's a function of you know, soil density, um, and then the length and widths of your stream banks or, or goalies. So all these processes are happening in the background to estimate um, pollutant transport. So we're calculating an annual load here, and I'm just highlighting one of the example equations that are used. This is specific to um, cropland. So we have W sub N, which is representing an annual load in pounds per year, V is representing volume here. That's estimated from our curve number method. And then the um, equation in the parentheses is a um, weighted nutrient concentration based on months that you're applying and not applying manure. And then there's some unit conversions here off to the right. In terms of load reductions, we're taking our same annual load equation, but then you're um, subtracting from that um, your resulting load when you've implemented a BMP. And E here is representing that BMP efficiency. All right, now we are going to jump into looking at the model interface and the different modules that are available. So when you are operating in PLET, um, you'll see that there's a standard menu up top. So we're gonna work our way from top to bottom. I first have boxed out the help menu and that's, you'd click on that to access PLET training videos, our PLET user guide, as well as um, references for our BMP efficiency values. The next um, option that I wanna uh, point out is the watershed drop down feature at the top. And this is where you're selecting the primary watershed that's going to populate the county and weather stations that the one that you would pick um, to estimate your precipitation data. Next, we have the add watershed feature. So if you were modeling um, more than just one field or HUC 12 watershed, this is where you would go to add in those additional, additional fields or watersheds. One thing to note is that in our, 
um, future release that's coming out, the add watershed feature and the delete watershed feature will all be housed in one, one button. The next um, component I want to point out is the urban BMP tool. This is where you would go to add urban BMPs here for the different um, nine urban land use types. We also have a manure application calculator. So this calculates the average number. If you remember what we saw in the um, load estimation calculation, the average number of months for manure application per year. So if you had varying rates of manure application, um, across a particular land use, this is where you would go to estimate um, an average number of months, an application rate, and then the BMP calculator. This is what you'll use to calculate your combined BMP efficiency when you're adding multiple BMPs to one land use type. We'll dive into this deeper, but um, what I mean by that is when you're using cropland as an example. If you're implementing multiple BMPs to one land use, they can be configured in different ways. The first example I'm showing here is parallel combination. So with parallel combination, say you have two plots of land, runoff separating, and it's going over one piece that has cover crops and then the other that has conservation tillage. This would be a, a parallel combination. Alternatively, you could have BMPs operating in series. So runoff, um, flows through uh, an area with conservation tillage, and then that same amount of runoff then goes through a grass buffer. So this would be a series uh, configuration. And you could also have a combination. So you have um, two plots of land that are with the BMP that are operating in parallel. One of those plots has a gra grass buffer at the edge of field, that's combination. And then all of your runoff is collecting again um, after it flows through those two plots into a set link basin. So just displaying here the different combinations that you can set up. And we'll actually do this um, in the BNB calculator in a bit. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna run through the different tabs that you'll see located here, the inputs, BMPs, total loads, and then the additional reference tables. So with the inputs tab, I've shown this before, I've scrolled down a little bit further so you can start to see some of these other input tables, um, but there are 10 input tables in total Tables one through five are the ones that are auto-populated based on the input data server. And then tables six through 10 um, are all default values. All values can be changed and customized. Um, so if you have more site-specific information, you're encouraged to go in and update those fields accordingly. The next tab is the BMPs tab. And this is where you would go to add in um, your BMPs per land use type. Um, and also create, if you have multiple BMPs on one land use, you'd be using your BMP calculator here and then adding it to um, our BMPs list. Um, oh, and just going back one second here, um, just remember that with the BMPs tab, if you're doing urban BMPs, that would be done using the urban, urban BMP tool. All right, and then the next tab is our total loads module. So this is where you would go to see the final results of the model calculation um, in terms of the pollutant loads and then load reductions from BMP's implementation. And there are several tables that are listed here. Um, the information is served up in, in different formats, um, but just highlighting um, how one of the table presents the information. So you can see that the first few columns are showing loads without BMP implementation, and then the next um, several columns showing what those load reductions look like after BMP implementation. And then last but not least, this last tab, additional references tables. Um, this is where you can go just to see some of the other um, values that are used for animal weights to calculate your animal equivalent units, soil infiltration rates, um, as well as others, including our BMP efficiency values. All right, so we walked through, got a feel for the interface. We know the background processes of how that works. Now we're gonna do a quick demo. So first um, you need to create an account and that's very easy and straightforward. You'll visit the PLET landing page and I've included that link here and you're gonna scroll down to the model documentation section and then click the link to PLET. Um, and a pop-up's gonna uh, open up requesting your organization email to create an account. Once an account's created, you can go into the tool and then you would select create a model to get a model up and running. 
So the first step after creating that create a new model button, um, you're going to get a pop up window that's asking you for um, initial information in terms of your the title of your project, what state you're working in, and then here is where you would go to um, select that primary watershed that's going to drive your your weather station data. Um, so you'll see that there's a county here and then the weather station that was selected. And this auto populates your, your rain, um, your precipitation factors down here. Okay, I just mentioned that you're going to want to name your model. Another feature here too that I wanted to point out um, is the lookup feature. And this is helpful if um, maybe you're accustomed to a different version of the um, watershed boundary data set, but you can click that button and it will pull up a map of where that, and show the boundary of that HUC-12 watershed, just to visually verify and confirm that that's the, the watershed um, you wanna be in and operating and in modeling. Okay, so step three um, is pointing out here that you can add as many watersheds or fields that you want to build out your scenario. Um, so the Half Moon Creek watershed um, was the one that I used to determine my um, weather station data, but then I also went ahead and added the um, big hollow watershed by cl clicking this add watershed button feature. And you can see that all of our um, land use acreage is auto-populated um, based on that HUC-12 that was selected. Steps four through seven in the quick guide um, is noting to add any detailed information if that's available. So you would modify that where it applies in tables one through 10. So say there was a local study that was done and you have more site-specific um, nutrient concentration data for runoff. You could go in and add that here um, to customize your, your model and make it more site-specific. One thing to point out though is that you know, for the input data server, that's operating at the HUC-12 scale. So if you are working at the field um, field scale, you would need to have that local site-specific data up front to um, populate the data fields as needed. And I wanted to point out how you would, if you are working at the, at the field scale, um, when you're setting up your model under the watershed dropdown, you'd be clicking a custom watershed here. And then in your input tabs, and here I'm just noting that I, I picked the county that was relevant to my area of study um, to get the right weather station that was closest to the field that I'm working on. Um, so in terms of inputting tables one through 10 when you're working at the field scale, um, you know, this is just a suggestion, recommendations of where you can go to, to get data to um, help fill in these inputs. But this list here is just noting, you know, you could visit your state's pages for um, local data and GIS files, um, get acreage information off of Google Maps, engage with local landowners, look at your ag census data. Um, you could go to USGS Sergo database for soil data. And then also another go-to is literature and white papers um, that might be specific to a certain area. All right, step eight, now we're in the BMP tab and that's where you're gonna to start to add your best management practices to the model scenario. So to help us with this, I set up a little example scenario uh, that we're gonna use. So for this particular case, um, we're working on cropland that has a total acreage of uh, 2,729 acres and we're implementing four different BMPs. Um, and I'm showing them here off to the right. So we have two BMPs that are working um, in parallel, conservation tillage and cover crops. And then on the other side here of the stream, um, we have two BMPs working in series. So we have contour farming and then riparian forest buffer. If we were to sum up the acreage of um, what all four of these BMPs are treating, we would see that it's treating 38% of um, the total cropland acreage. So just keep that number in the back of your head. Now, because we're implementing multiple BMPs on one land use, we need to use the BMP calculator. So you would click that and plot, and that's gonna pop up the, the BMP, BMP calculator screen. So we're gonna build out a scenario that matches that picture that we were just looking at. 
So the first thing you want to do is select the create node button. And a blue box like this is going to pop up. So this is our first BMP that we're implementing. And then you can see off to the right here in the node info, uh, we're going to fill in some information here um, to characterize this BMP. So I selected contour farming from the BMP dropdown menu. Um, and then I also named the node as contour farming, contour farming. And I manually added the acreage that um, this BMP is addressing. So 200, 200 acres. The efficiencies here auto populate um, from our, our default values within PLET, but these also can be adjusted um, if you have more site specific information. The next thing you want to do is save your node before you add another one. Um, so showing an example here of getting the first one set up, contour farming, and then I went ahead and added our other BMPs. So our contour farming is in series with our repairing buffer, which is this blue box here. And then we have two that are operating in parallel, conservation tillage and cover crops. And I manually entered in the acreage that each of these are, each of these is treating. So again, series and parallel, um, and it's hard to see on my presenting screen, but hopefully um, it's visible to you guys. So in this new node here that I'm that I'm circling, this is not a BMP. What it's the you know, function of this node, um, you're entering in here any acreage that is not treated. So this 1,679 is the remaining cropland acreage that's not managed by these four BMPs. And it checks out because you can see here in this box, we have our total acreage that this configuration is managing. And then associated with that is the new um, combined calculated BMP efficiency accounting for, for all these four BMPs and the acreage that they're addressing. Um, okay, and I'll make my other point on the next slide. All right, so well, I guess before we exit out of here, the next thing you're going to want to do is save the name of your configuration. So here I just called it AFT example up at the top. Another nice thing about what is you can um, look up past um, look up past configurations and you can see them in a thumbnail and click them and apply them to a future a future model scenario. Okay, so we exited out of the BMP calculator and now I'm gonna add that combined BMP to the model. So I go to the drop down menu in the BMPs tab here, and you can see that the one we just created, AFT example, is available. So we would select that. The BMP efficiencies here would auto populate based on that new calculated efficiency. But then the next thing um, that you'll have to do as the user is manually enter the percent area that that BMP is applied to. If you remember the way we set up that scenario, it's treating all 2,700 acres of cropland. So with, for this particular case, um, this BMP applies to 100% of the cropland. But if we set that up differently and um, set this area to zero, then that would be the case where we would use 38% here because we didn't account for all the acreage um, in how the configuration was set up. So I hope that makes sense. Um, it's an important distinction that I wanted to make. Uh, and if it doesn't, we, could, we can talk more about it and you can pose a question um, towards the end. Um, okay, and then the next thing that I just wanted to point out here in the BMP portion is that I also added for our other watershed, Big Hollow, here just showing an example where I only implemented one BMP for this particular land use. Um, so just selected prescribed grazing from the drop down menu, um, my efficiency is auto populated, and then I entered in the percent area that this applies to, which was 15%. If you remember um, earlier, if urban BMPs were of interest, um, you would use the urban BMP tool to add those. So I just wanted to, to highlight that um, in case that's of interest to the group. So you would click the urban BMP tool and up top here, you would select the watershed that this applies to. And there's nine different um, sub land uses for urban. So here I selected institutional uh, for this project, I'm implementing bioretention. Um, you know, I'll be implementing several 
basins, but they treat a total acreage of 20 acres. And then for this particular BMP, um, this runoff um, panel populates as well because this is a BMP that we can also calculate volume reduction estimates for. So the information that you need to input is the percent impervious, um, which I put 80% here, and these BMPs are going to be designed to treat the first inch of rainfall. So I've entered that information in, and then if you just scroll down the BMP tool, you can see that towards the bottom, um, it'll report out your captured flow volumes in gallons per year, um, and here's our institutional land use. I also created, added one for single family um, as well. All right, we're getting towards the end. We're on step nine. So step nine is to view the, the estimates of load and load reductions in the total loads module. So all the results will be reported here. Some things to note is that you can download these tables using the button over to the right. And then you'll also see that there's two check boxes at the top here. The first is for groundwater load calculations. So if you check that box, the model is also going to account for groundwater loads based on that percent uh, precipitation that's infiltrating. The next box is to treat all sub watersheds as a single watershed. So this only applies if you're working with um, one or more fields um, or one or more HUC 12 watersheds. If you click this box um, for your universal soil loss equation, it's going to be treating your drainage area. It's going to sum up all the acreage across all your fields or watersheds um, as one drainage area in your sediment delivery or delivery ratio. So that's what that um, that function is doing. Um, but outside of that, after you enter your input, your inputs, your BMPs, um, this is where you would go to see all your results populated. Um, all right, so now we're going to, for the last part here, kind of zoom out and we're going to look at three different project example types that have used PLET. I'm also going to share resources for where you can all go to learn more um, and also note some future updates that are coming soon. The first example that I wanted to highlight is for a watershed-based plan, and this is for the watershed-based plan for the Moore River Upper Canadian Plateau. Um, and this was from a few years back, so step L was used here. Um, but for this watershed-based plan, they used um, pollutant loading rates determined um, from EPA's basins model, and then load reductions were estimated using step L. Um, and I'm just like, highlighting some of the results here in the table up top. So for a specific reach, um, they estimated their um, loads to the reach using basins which is shown in this first column here. And then both total nitrogen and total phosphorus load reductions were estimated um, using step L for the um, BMPs that they were planning to implement. So that's one example of how this tool has been used and applied. And also um, special thanks to Brian Fontenot in region six who, who shared this example with me. The next example, this is a, a larger scale project and it's evaluating the impact of regenerative ag practices. So this project um, is um, a partnership between General Mills and the Sand County Foundation. And they're looking at six different BMP adoption scenarios, which are all listed at the top here. And then regenerative ag, which is the sixth one is a combination um, of the previous five. And for this project, they're looking at, um, it's specific to the Lake Michigan basin and they're focusing on phosphorus and sediment um, TMDL uh, watersheds, which are highlighted in the blue and the pink shading. And the anticipated outcome of this project is to estimate phosph phosphorus load reductions um, and compare them to the, the project water quality goals. And special thanks to Haley Summers, who I believe is on this webinar for sharing uh, this example with me. The third example is an example of a watershed and lake protection plan. So this project is evaluating the use of PLET to determine non-point source loads to Lake Dehernal. I hope I said that right. And what is really interesting about this project and is a unique application is that they're conducting wet weather sampling to determine their current event mean concentrations um, for land uses that are being represented in the model. Um, so they're going out into the field 
collecting samples so they can put in um, more site-specific nutrient runoff concentrations into the model. And future phases of the project um, are going to look at candidate locations for BMPs associated with total phosphorus load reductions. Um, groups involved here are the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Kleinenfelder, and then the West Monmouth Utilities Authority. And special thanks here to Aaron Devell um, from Kleinenfelder for who shared this project, um, who shared this project with me. Okay, where you can go learn where you can go to learn more. Um, we have a variety of resources to help users. Um, a great place to start is the PLET website. We have a lot of documentation loaded to this page, including our um, user manual as well as our BMP definition stack. So if you wanted to get a better understanding of um, how a BMP is defined or characterized in PLET, that would be a great resource to take a look at. We also have PLET training videos, which you can access through our webpage, and then they're also available through PLET, themselves, PLET itself within the help drop-down menu. And you can always reach out via our help desk email. Um, and that's supported by our um, contractor, TetraTech, as well as EPA. Looking ahead, I, I mentioned this upfront in the webinar, but we do have a new release that um, will be coming soon, likely the beginning of November. Um, and this includes a few updates to just the interface. So one of them I already mentioned is um, the new add watershed and delete watershed button that will be all housed within one function just to make it a little bit easier on the user. And um, another update is that once the primary watershed is selected and the models run, um, it's going to be frozen into that model. So it can't change. Um, it can't be changed after a model a model is run. So those are two, two updates that are coming soon. And then we're always working on evaluating opportunities to update and improve the model. And that's what makes um, working on PLET so much fun. Um, some of the projects that are ongoing um, are looking at water quality outcomes of protection work. Um, we're always trying to integrate the most recent data into the input data server, as well as for BMP efficiencies. And we are always listening to suggestions from the users. They can stem up from you know, people just reaching out um, the email or even through webinars like this. Um, users always share ideas that help us, give us um, ideas on how we can make the tool more efficient. Um, for you guys. So stay in touch. I included my email at um, the bottom of the slide, and you can also reach out via our um, PLET email from our for help desk. Um, but with that, um, that is all I had prepared for today. I think we're going to open it up for questions, but I believe Aisha had one more slide that she wanted to share. Well, thank you, Adrian. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and get to the questions first. Okay. Um, and then when we're done with the question and answer session, I'll go ahead and share my last slide. Sure. Um, so it looks like we currently have six questions. Um, the first is, um, why has the sheet slash real erosion process not been updated to reflect the outda updated mm -hmm. uh, R-U-S-L-E-2 that NRCS Russell is- Russell yeah. Russell too. Yeah, is currently using. Are there any plans to update that parameter? Yep, that's a great question. We are actually in the process of doing that right now. Great. Um, PLET has every watershed in the United States. All of our HUC twelve watersheds um, can be implemented into the tool. Fantastic. Um, we have a question about what exactly is a node. So a node, um, node was referring to in the BMP calculator when you're setting up your configuration, a node is just associated with one particular BMP. So we had, for example, um, our conservation tillage, that was one node, and then your farce buffer, that was another node. It was just referring to those little boxes where you're defining the different BMPs that are implemented. Um, so that was an anonymous uh, uh, attendee that asked that. Um, mm -hmm. So if the person who asked that, um, uh, if that, if they need a, a more in-depth answer, uh, if you can go ahead and put that in the 
uh, question, that would be great. Otherwise, um, I'll go into the next question. Um, so another anonymous attendee said, I'm confused on the 100% of applied to cropland in the example. Mm -hmm. Using 1,700 acres of BMPs doesn't cover the full 2,000 plus cropland acres of the watershed. Should there be a node set to no BMP? Oh, uh, I, lost it. I lost that question. Hold on. Wasn't the... Oh, there it is. Uh, to no BMP to account for the acres not having a BMP applied in the configuration in order for us to use 100% of the cropland acres. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um... And hopefully this makes sense. <clears throat> so the way we set this up, um, let me just go back to the example. Okay, so the way this was set up, we have 200 acres of conservation tillage and then runoff here. Um, some of it flows into the riparian forest buffer and that treats 500. 500 acres. Um, and then we have 200 acres conservation tillage and 200 acres of contour farming. So that's a total acreage of 1,050. When you set up your nodes, each node for each BMP is associated with an acreage. So for our series one, and I don't think I, I pointed this out, so we have the 200 acres of contour farming. The riparian forest buffer, it treats 500, but because 200 are already accounted for with contour farming, I only have 300 noted here. And then we have 200 for conservation tillage and then um, 350 for cover crops. The sum of this is 1,050 acres. The remaining acreage that's not treated is reflected in this, this node, which is essentially um, whoever asked the question, they were saying like a, a node that's no treatment. Um, that's what this is representing. See, there's no efficiencies here listed for nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment. But we do have our remaining acreage that's not treated. That's where that 100% comes in because the way we set up this configuration, um, all 2,700 acres are accounted for in how this uh, configuration was set up. Um, I hope that made more sense. Uh, but just let me know if it didn't in the chat. And another, Appendix A of the user guide does a very nice job of um, describing how this is set up. So that's another good resource as well. Great. Um, is there a limit to the number of individual models that can be stored in the input? I don't believe so. Um, Alex can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't believe there's a limit. Yeah, absolutely. This is Alex, uh, part of the Plex support team. Uh, no, there's no limit to the number of models that you can have. And there's also functionality for sharing and copying models as well. So uh, everything is going to be tracked on your listing of models on the, uh, the welcome page. Thanks, Alex. Great, thank you. Um, are wetlands included in the available BMPs or are they mostly field management type BMPs? Wetlands are not included. Okay. Um, any idea on the timeline of implementing the Russell 2 update? Um, that's another great question. Um, hopefully, Hopefully soon. I can't get. I can't pinpoint a time, but we're we're working on it right now. We're working through some decision points. Um, so I guess I would say in the near term. I just can't tie a tie a date to it. All right. Um, how do you do series and parallel? Okay, so series and parallel. It stems back to that example we were just looking at. Um, but I will just to make this more clear. Um, one thing you'll notice in this, whoops, pointing before I started, started sharing. Um, so one thing you'll notice in this setup are these lines here. So when you create a node, um, you'll have the box 
you know, a box pops up and you add another node and there's another box, but they're not connected. You actually have to drag and connect via these lines. Um, so nodes connected with the line in between them, that's representing a combination in series and then nodes where uh, the line just connects out um, to another node would be in parallel. I actually have a quick question about, oh, if you want to pull that back up, <laughs> sorry. Do you, sorry. Do you want to pull that back up for a second? Yep. I, have, yep. I actually have a question about that. Um, so with the contour farming in the Riparian buffer, you said that, that um, it's, it's 500 altogether, but 200 of one and, and 300 of the other. Is that correct? Yeah, so the total acreage here is 500 acres. Um, mm -hmm. The riparian buffer is, you know, at the edge of the contour farming, but it's it's also it's treating 300 acres of as we've noted here, in addition okay. to the 200 um, before. It. Oh, okay. Is that why you add the riparian buffer second because then it takes in that 200 yes. of the contour farming? Yeah. So if it. If riparian buffer was routing into the contour farming, um, that wouldn't be, I'm trying to think if this is true. Um, it wouldn't be the same setup. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, another question, this one's from uh, Andrew. Will the BMP efficiency updates be specific to regions of the US? Example, region five, upper Midwest states versus south states. Um, that's a great question. So a lot of our BMP efficiencies, not a lot, they're all based on literature. Um, so those are just, ag it's aggregated and summarized across um, at a national scale. So we don't, um, we don't define them um, in regions. Um, but with the resources available, you could dive into them to get a more low, um, regional or site-specific value. Uh, but the way they're stored in PLET or served up, it's at um, a summary national scale. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully that answered that question for them. If not, yeah, please uh, ask a follow-up in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to jump to the last one because it has to do with those nodes again. Um, mm -hmm. So you might want to just keep that slide up for a little bit because I think that people have a lot of questions about that. Um, so it says, so the acreage in the nodes and the percent applied are separate from the total acres in the input tab. Are separate from the total and the input tab. In this particular case, um, no. So for the um, half moon watershed. This was the total acreage for cropland. Um, and it's just how I set this model up. I'm looking at the question again. Or is it separate from the total acres? Um, yeah, in this case, no, it's not separate. Um, I'm trying to think of a case where like it could be. Because no matter what, if you're setting up a uh, a combined BMP, it's going to be specific to a particular land use. So somehow, however way you configure it, it's it's going to be related to the total acreage of that particular land use. If that if that makes sense. Okay. Um, another question: uh, Why did you use eighty percent for the impervious factor? That was just a, a hypothetical. I for that particular case, I was just saying, okay, 80% of that institutional land use um, has impervious cover. Okay. Not impervious factor, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, what literature are you using to determine the BMP uh, efficiency rates? That is a great question. Um, so, the cropland and pasture land BMP efficiencies, they were, um, EPA recently did a pretty extensive literature review back in 2017. And you can see all of those um, sources um, as well as the other land use ones. If you just go down to the um, 
help drop down menu and take a look at that BMP efficiency reference guide. I can't recall them all at the top of my head. Um, I was in here during that time, but yeah, that's a great, great resource to check out to, um, to answer that question more specifically. Um, the next question is, thank you for providing the references for the input data. How often are these updated? And is there a way to find out the year of the data set? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, in the um, plot user guide, it does indicate the current year associated with that data source. Um, and that is something too that we're working on right now is starting to integrate um, more updated sources and finding ways to kind of just do that um, routinely and or automatically over time. So for example, the national um, land cover data, um, updating that routinely as it, as it updates. All right. Um, and then uh, going back to the question uh, with uh, about the will the BMP efficiency updates be specific to regions. Uh, so Tammy responded, I created custom BMPs with my state specific data for each BMP so I could capture the more accurate regional data. And then Andrew responded, will PLET describe what studies from what state slash region are used to define BMP efficiency uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, we don't want to use BMP efficiency from Georgia for cover crops. Okay. Um, wait, so Aisha, can you, that second part about like showing the regional, can you? Uh, we'll let describe what studies from what okay. state and region are used to define BMP efficiency. Yeah, these are all um, great questions, and I love these ideas. So <laughs> another thing that we've also talked about within the PLET team and the group is a way where, um, and this has just been like discussed um, in kind of like an infancy stage, but if people do have other studies that are more site specific and they're bringing in, um, creating um, like a database of sorts where people could see, oh, user X, you know, use this paper that's specific to Iowa um, for like this reason. So it could be a way to just share um, other resources that may be more site specific. So no, there's nothing available like that now, um, but that, that is an idea that, that we have discussed um, within the group. Great. Um, the next question is from uh, Chelsea. It says, um, if you can total all BMPs up for a specific land use and apply it to 100% of the applied area, why does it need to be tied to the acreage generated in the input tab? Why does it need to be generated? Um, do you mind reading that part? Yeah, oh, yeah, actually, yeah. I, I see it right here. If okay. you can total all the BMPs up for specific land use and apply it to 100% of the applied area, why does it need to be tied to the acreage generated in the input tab? Oh, and then there's a response. Hold on. Sorry. sorry. Uh, they said, I'm sorry. It's hard to convey this question over text. Instead of yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna try to see, I'm like thinking through this and Chelsea, please feel free to follow up with me um, if I'm not answering this. Uh, so if we totaled up all the VMPs for cropland um, and applied it to 100% of the applied area, oh, I guess I see, but you'd still need, you still be, need, an, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, would it be easier if I let Chelsea talk? I can of actually course, allow sure, her to sure. talk. Okay. Yeah. Chelsea, I am allowing you to talk. Hopefully that works. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for letting me speak this instead of typing it. It's a little bit easier. Sure. Um, so essentially, when you, when you add a watershed, right, you have to select an actual watershed. So right. you've selected your watershed and it pre-populates all of those acreage for each of the land types. So then you go to the BMPs, and if you're doing combined BMPs, you, know, you go through the process that you just described, and then you individually add the acreages, right, mm -hmm. of each BMP, which I totally follow. That's very similar. It's 
like step L. Um, but I guess my question is, um, if we're totaling up, like you had the 200 and then the 300 equals 500. Yeah. And that, in that slide that you had before, uh -huh. that's totaling up 500, you have them in, in a certain order and that's fine. But then we're going to apply it to a hundred percent of the, of that area, right? Let's just take the 200 and the 300 and not the other ones. If you're going to say, let's, we're applying this to a hundred percent of that 500 acres total. How does that relate back to what you're getting in the input tab? Like why, I guess, why does it reference the input tab at all? That's auto-populated. So the, um, the input tab is just over, you know, that acreage is coming over. Um, are we talking about here? Uh, no. So it's it's on the inputs and in, go to the far left, all the way over to the far left. Like when you first select the watershed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so all your land use acres, right? Yes, this is, this right is through there. Acres. Yes, exactly. So you have a custom watershed here, but if I had selected, um, you know, a real watershed, it's pre-populating all of that data in. Mm -hmm. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that information in this pre-populated table here affecting or going to be affected by what's in the BMP tab separately? Um. Well, when you select your land use, like in this case, yes, because this cropland yeah, is tying back. Thing. It's tying okay. back to whatever the acreage is for cropland for the Half Moon Creek watershed. So in this case, yeah, it's pulling in for this example, that's 2,700. Um, and you talked whatever. about how you could do it separately where you could either say it's applied to 100% of the cropland listed or... 38%. Right. So that's, that gets into how you set up your, um, your configuration and your BMP calculator. Um, so the point I was trying to make was that when you set up this example, you could do it one of two ways. You could just set it up so that the only acreage that's accounted for here is the acreage the BMPs are treating. So that's like the 1,050 acres, say. Right. Um, in that case, yeah, that's only 38% of the total cropland, right? So when I get to this stage, I'm putting 38% here because I only accounted for those 1,050 acres in this scenario. I, I didn't fill, this would be essentially zero here, the remaining acreage. Mm -hmm. Are you following me? Yes, in the remaining acreage, I see. So you have to have that like end node. When you do any of these with combined BMPs, you have to have the end node. If yes, to, to represent that additional acreage that's not treated, because this is, this is a weighted, essentially what this is doing, is just weighting your BMP efficiencies across the different, across the, the total acreage, right? Okay. So this number is going to be different if I have a zero here, or if I have 1,679 acres. So, so this number is going to be different, which changes how you're going to apply your percent area. Now, when you compare the two different ways to calculate that, again, by the, you know, the 38% or the 100%, mm -hmm. however you set this up, are those going to come out to be the exact same it, it numbers? Should be the, yep, it should be the exact same, and that's why the distinction's important. So if I if I set it up this way, where I have, <laughs> I'm not confusing people, people more, um, if I set up this way with that remaining area, 1,679, um, but then I, I enter in 38% here instead of 38% or instead of 100%, excuse me, I'm going to get um, a much smaller load reduction um, yeah. because that's just not how I, I represented it. Now, is there the a benefit or does it really not matter how you no, set it's, that up? It, I think it's just ease, it's preference and, you know, how you choose to do it. Um, okay. But definitely... You know, if people are like, oh my gosh, now I'm even more confused. Appendix A of the user guide um, does a really nice job of highlighting this. But yeah, there's no, it's really up to the user what they prefer and are most comfortable with. Okay. And just to be clear, in the inputs tab, you can also change the acreages for each land use if you need to. Yep. Correct. Okay. Yes.
Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you letting me, letting me. Yeah, of course. (laughs) I'm going to remove your permission to talk now, but thank you. Oh, uh, where'd you go? There you are. Um, all right. So the next question, um, see, so Andrew said, uh, we are also starting to use custom BMPs with state specific data in Wisconsin, Tammy. Okay. So that was a response to Tammy in the previous question they had. Um, and then Tammy says, can you do an example of how the 38% would look like on the configuration? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, and this question looked like it came in right before, um, Chelsea and I started chatting, ah. but I think, I think I answered that question, but essentially that this box would be, um, I always forget to share this box here for the 38%, this area would be zero. There would be nothing, there would be no number here. You wouldn't be a reset. You wouldn't be including the remaining cropland that's not treated. It would just be a zero. And that would be your 38% setup. All right. Um, I actually have another question. <laughs> um, so you're showing this, so the, once again, with contra farming in the riparian buffer, you're showing uh, land that's in series. So uh, it's being uh, combined because there are two practices being used on the same piece of land. Um, whereas the conservation tillage and the cover crops are on two separate pieces of land. Is that correct? Is that how I'm reading that? Um, the parallel are on two separate pieces of land? Yeah. Yeah, parallel is just, it's more, um, parallel you can think of just like runoff is, you know, splitting up and running off over two separate like plots, plots of land. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if, if the conservation tillage and the cover crops were on the same piece of land, would that be in series? And if it's the same amount of land, what would that look like? So if these were in series, um, like, let's say you have 200 acres, um, that are doing both conservation tillage and cover crops on that same 200 acres, would you have one with 200 and then the other with zero? I think you would set that up where, yeah, you would just have your cropland say you had your conservation tillage listed first with 200 acres, and then that would flow into your um, cover crops. And that area would be zero because you're not treating any additional acreage, but the way it's here, we have 200 and 350. Um, Mm -hmm. So the difference there is 150. So really the cover crops would have 150 in the area if they were in series. Great. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, we're a little early. Um, we still have 20 minutes left of the uh, webinar, but if any, if we don't have any other questions, um, I can go ahead and show my last slide and we can get out of here a little early. Um, so let me go ahead and show the screen. I'll... Uh, I'm sorry, that was not the same place. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Oh, that's not right. Uh, hold on. Sorry about this. I think I have the wrong. Oh, oh that's right. I don't know why it's not showing the right one. Sorry about this, everyone. Um, I will be with you in just a second. (laughs) Okay, here we go. (sighs) I don't know why it's doing that. I'm just gonna have to go through all, sorry. It's not letting me start from the last slide.
And there we go. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Here are some next, next steps in our collective outcomes quantification journey. First, we look forward to you joining us at, at some or all of the next set of tool training webinars that will be held on the first Wednesday of every month, except January, which will be held on the second Wednesday due to the neighboring holiday. Um, if you can't make it to one or more of the webinars but want to view the session, the recording should be available by the following Monday. Second, at the end of the webinar, please share your feedback with us by answering a quick six question survey uh, that Kenzie shared at the link at the beginning of the session. And it will also appear as a new tab in your internet browser when the webinar ends. Um, please take a couple of minutes to share your feedback so we can keep improving these events. And don't forget that starting this month, you'll be entered into a drawing for a gift card just for filling out the survey. We thank you in advance for your participation and good luck. Um, and as a reminder, Michelle and I are also still offering free coaching services to six farm project managers who secure a session with us. These sessions are individually tailored to you in order to help you figure out which tools or methods are right for your project. If you're interested, just email me, Aisha Tap Ross, and in the subject line, write coaching request. And finally, if you'd like a free print copy of the guide to be mailed to you, you can place that order online at the report's website, which you can easily find using the keywords AFT outcomes tools. And thank you again for your participation and we look forward to seeing you on the first. Well, thank you, Adrian. I'm going to stop.